Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and thank you very much for coming. I'm Peter Basildritt, Chair of Arts Council in England. A very, very warm welcome to you all to what is Bir Birmingham's premier event this morning. <laughs> yes, the Duke of Cambridge is visiting the building next door, but we regard that as a mere sideshow <laughs> to what we're doing here, and I'm sure he'd think the same. Can I just give you a sense of what we're going to do now between now and about 12.30, 12.45? I'm going to talk to you for about 20 minutes. We've then got a short film. Then we've got an excellent panel to discuss as many of the issues raised as they want. And then a very important part of the day, we've got 20, 25 minutes for a discussion for everybody. So please do bear that in mind during the proceedings. Points you want to make, questions you want to ask, you will get your chance. Please do take part. And then at the end, you'll hear a word from my colleague, Abid Hussain. That'll be around 12.30, 12.45. So thank you very much. Now, a year ago, I committed the Arts Council and our partners, funded organisations of England, funded arts organisations of England, to a fundamental shift in the way we approach diversity. I said then that we would no longer let progress with this crucial issue be abandoned to a small group of specialist organisations that had for years been brilliant champions of the cause, but in terms of effecting lasting chains, change to the arts establishment, were themselves by definition on the outside looking in. That for us to make real progress, diversity had to really become part of all the work we all do. That it had to go mainstream. And the way, the way to do it was through what we call the creative case for diversity. Understanding diversity as an opportunity within which we'll find new art and fresh ideas. I'm here today a year on to review progress in what will be the first of our annual presentations and discussions, holding all of us to account. There are two questions then. How are we doing? And what are we going to be doing about it going forward? Forgive me, but in answering, I will cite quite a lot of statistics because we have to measure how we're doing and report openly. There's that old maxim, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Likewise, I'll talk about our programs, because that's how we're addressing the challenge. I'm not here today to say, mission accomplished. In fact, as I think you probably agree with me, we're just getting started. We all know it's about changing minds, and it isn't a quick fix. We're not looking for dramatic change. In fact, apologies to the theatre people present, we don't want drama. We want genuine, sustainable progress. Apologies once again to our theatre friends, some of whom will be on the panel and can exact their revenge later. To start with, I'd like to remind you of some of the fundamental principles of public investment. First, public funding should be invested for the benefit of all the public. Second, it shall draw on all the talents. As our chief executive, Darren Henley, puts it, Talent is everywhere, opportunity is not, not yet. And to achieve real diversity, we've got to change things, and that's what go we're going to do. And I'm very pleased, he's not quite a year into his job yet, to see the commitment that he's showing to this subject. Last year, I talked about how we must give opportunities to everyone, from the children of middle-class Asian parents to the children of white working-class families. How we must make visible those members of society that too often we do not see disabled and deaf people, or older people. I talked about how we must cross all social barriers, not only the protected characteristics, but also class and geography. In May this year, our Chief Executive Darren Henley announced an important shift in our distribution of funding. By 2018, we're committed to increasing our use of lottery funds outside London by at least five percentage points, from 70% to 75%. Now, an important part of that will be the Ambition for Excellence Fund, a three-year, 35.2 million fund to develop talent and leadership in the regions, to support work of increased ambition and help build cultural capacity. It'll fund work that contributes to the creative case. And close on one million has already been allocated with awards to the Tricycle Theatre and Urban Music. We intend to spend more than 31 million of the 35 million outside London. That means more money for arts organisations all over England. 
Alongside this, we're also looking at how we can build demand for our grants for the arts applications in areas of need outside London. It's a significant step in our commitment to reaching more communities. We also announced an additional £10 million of investment over the next two years in our Creative People and Places programme, which is targeting, at the moment, 21 areas with low arts engagement from Liverpool to Luton. Creative People and Places, still relatively young, is beginning to make a real impact on people's lives, no matter where they come from, who they are, how old they are. Some 75% of people it works with haven't had much previous engagement with the arts. There's also been a big contribution to inclusion through our strategic touring programme. Earlier this year, for example, Ramps to the Moon, a consortium of seven theatres led by New Wolsey Theatre Ipswich, received £2.3 million for work by, with and for disabled performers and audiences. This is the largest strategic touring award we've made. Libraries are also an important part of our work. And through our development role, we've been promoting libraries as spaces for education, research, business, and personal well-being for everyone. We know that they already have a very diverse user base. And that's been added to by programs such as Enterprising Libraries and this year's national rollout of Wi-Fi, which offers free public access. Hand in hand with promoting participation, we have to challenge the circle of privilege that exists or has existed around arts and education. We know the importance, the incredible critical importance, of cultural education to improving outcomes for children and young people. Typically, where this is most needed is in those areas where provision is most dispersed or stretched. That's why this autumn, and you may have heard about it or you may be participating in it, we launched the Cultural Education Challenge, so arts and educational organisations can work better together through a national network of cultural educational partnerships. By more targeted distribution of our investment, by focusing on marginalised communities, by putting the formerly invisible centre stage, and by ensuring that more children and young people can enjoy the opportunities of cultural education, these are some of the ways in which we are building diversity into our thinking so that everybody will know that the arts are for them. So it becomes a creative shaping process for us that will make for a richer arts and culture and a richer nation. And I say richer also in a material sense as well as a metaphorical one, because diversity also means that we can find new audiences and income streams. It's not like any of this, an overnight process, but change is coming and will come. Look, for example, at two recent examples from literature, at the success of the Bradford Literature Festival in attracting a quarter of a million pounds, 250,000 pounds from Provident Financial. Or Book Trust's first large-scale touring project, which took them to local communities in the West Midlands, Bradford and Middlesbrough, for which they raised from private sources an additional 30,000 pounds. All this reflects our determination that diversity should never again be pushed to the margins, that diversity should be understood as an opportunity for all in the interests of everyone. However, we know that in advancing a social agenda, it's deeds, not words, that count. We need to show progress in defined and specific ways. We need data. So far as data goes, many of the touchstones of progress remain our evaluation around BME and deaf and disabled representation. These are key indicators of progress. Last year, I reported on our equality analysis for the year 2013-14. This year's figures for 14-15 show an encouraging increase in BME representation in the workforce of our national portfolio organisations from 13% to 13.7%. This brings us more in line with levels of representation in the general population. It actually translates into 576 more jobs. BME representation at manager level has now risen above 10%. It was shortly just, it was before it was just below. But in contrast to these advances, the data around disabled and deaf representation is largely static. Slightly more staff, fractionally fewer managers, and discernibly fewer board members. We know there are particular issues around disabled and deaf representation, including access, that require a concerted response. 
we're addressing this. It's worth noting, for example, in Grants for the Arts, we spent an additional £50,000 last year supporting access for disabled applicants. And it's therefore good to see that there's been an increase in successful applications from disabled artists for Grants for the Arts, which are now at 4%, reversing a downward trend from the previous year. There was also encouraging data from Grants for the Arts about BAME representation. In 2014-15, 11.2% of awards were to BME applicants, and that was more than a point up, which I think is significant. And again, with gender, we're pleased that the workforce is, you could argue, more than balanced between men and women, with women occupying nearly 60% 60% of managerial positions. So some progress, and many areas in which we still have to do better. We'll be providing new guidance to organisations looking to improve their workforce diversity. This will address important areas for positive action, including some difficult subjects, like writing job descriptions and mitigating against unconscious bias. There's much we can do ourselves. It takes effort, does it not, to challenge our assumptions and the innate tendency to default to the choices we're most comfortable with. But the right decisions are not always the most comfortable ones. We can all be more courageous, and we have to be more rigorous, and we have to be fairer. The Arts Council has taken a look at the makeup of its own workforce. We're a little behind the sector in the overall figure for BME representation, and slightly more diverse at leadership level. We're going to apply the same lessons to ourselves as others, and we have introduced obligatory equality training. But to understand the impact of these measures, as I said before, we need data. I talked about the need for this last year. We cannot evaluate or substantiate our progress merely with anecdotes. As I promised, we'll be publishing data about the composition of our MPOs, senior leadership and boards, our larger MPOs, and additional information about contracted and temporary staff. In fact, today, we'll be highlighting online those statistics, the employment profiles of our larger MPOs, so everyone can see how they compare. We've recently published a report by the museum's consultancy about the diversity of our major partner museums. These are making real progress, engaging new audiences, but demonstrating diversity within the workforce, which actually has a much slower turnover, perhaps, than some arts organizations, remains a challenge. There are historic reasons, as I say, for that, which the sector is addressing through an action plan that's being taken forward now with our museum partners. However, and I will repeat this as often as it takes, we still need better data. And while we respect the right of individuals not to identify in surveys, if you don't participate, it may actually weaken the overall case for public funding. We currently don't know anything about the ethnicity, gender, or disabled status of 20% of the workforce. One in five is simply unknown. People have the right not to identify, but it's holding us back. We love, don't we, the poet John Donne's famous line, no man is an island entire unto itself. Well, when it comes to public investment and data, none of us is an island, no matter our gender, sexuality, or ethnicity. If we all want to benefit, if we all want to benefit, we need to participate. So please, please fill in your data returns for your sake. Please proselytize on the subject. Please persuade your colleagues to fill in the data for the sake of everyone. I have no doubt we'll be returning to this subject, and I'm certainly not going to be silent on it. Now, the heart of last year's speech was, of course, the creative case for diversity, how all our national portfolio organizations would be required to show that they were implementing this in their programming over the next three years, that they would be making their work more reflective of their communities and representative of 21st century England. We know that the evolution of the creative case will take time, It's a major change in the way we approach the issue of diversity. It challenges us to bring diversity out of a box and make it part of a mainstream conversation. It requires a change of mindset. It's just seven months into the era of the creative case. We know how seriously it's being taken. It's leading to much discussion. It's already producing some excellent work, bringing together organizations of different scales and disciplines. And we're looking for those partnerships that bring together the best resourced with the most streetwise. Take what's happening around Birmingham and the Midlands. The Belgrade Coventry is home 
to Critical Mass, a nationally recognized program offering a platform for emerging writers from BME communities. There's the work of the Icon Gallery, which recently hosted an exhibition by Van Lee Burke, chronicling the lives of Britain's African and Caribbean communities. And the new Faith in Birmingham Gallery, here at the Birmingham Museum and Arts Gallery, which I actually visited last week, is going to focus on six faiths with the largest representation in the city, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, and Judaism. Eventually, it'll incorporate all other religions. As I walked around the embryonic space, the faith gallery, with um, Ellen McAdam, I was really impressed about the way she explained to me that she was using so-called active curation to involve communities in creating what's in this particular space. And I loved what she said to me about the people who were already in the, in the, in the, in the gallery, so that they, they enjoyed having a safe space in which to discuss their differences. My God, we could do with more of that. And I've been very encouraged to move on um, by the other things I've experienced over the last few months. Let me give you a few examples. In Leicester, I was at the opening of the new gallery at Attenborough Arts Centre, which was launched with an exhibition putting the politics of disability centre stage with your car hanging from the ceiling, Tony. Yes, very good. I enjoyed that exhibit. Um, in Bexhill, I saw in the realms of others an exhibition of brilliant work by artists with profound intellectual impairment mounted by project artworks of the Delaware Pavilion. And last month, I went to the MOBO Awards in Leeds, where I learned that MOBO is teaming up with the London Theatre Consortium to help address the lack of diversity at executive level by offering six-month fellowships across leading theatres. But the process will be a conversation. There are no hard and fast rules about what the creative case should mean to each arts organisation. To sharpen our thinking, we've been looking at the ratings process for the creative case. To begin with, we had this 97% of organisations receiving a met or good rating on the basis of their proposed plans. We were encouraged by that, but then we said to ourselves, are we being exacting enough? Well, we think our rating process needs to be more testing, so we will be rating organisations again on the basis of their actual delivery, ensuring that we have more rigorous assessments of what we actually mean by met and good. I'd like to highlight the work of Creative Case North, a forum developed by our funded organisations with a practical focus on discussing how the creative case can be a natural part of the way of working. We look forward to more such sharing of ideas. I think it shows there's some dynamism in this process now, and that's really encouraging. Alongside this conversation about the creative case, we're looking at areas of policy that no longer necessarily express the subtleties of the issue. For example, I talked last year about how current diverse-led definition did not always include organisations being led by significant and influ influential individuals from diverse communities. So that huge investment I talked about, Ramps to the Moon, for example, the 2.3 million to promote the work of disabled artists, is not recognised as a diverse-led initiative under the current definitions. I think that's discouraging for the people involved. So we've commissioned an independent report into how to develop definitions that will serve all of us better. Now we come to the money. We were able last year to announce that we'll be making six million pounds of strategic funds available to support work around diversity and the creative case. We have in fact gone further. So I can announce today over the next five months, we'll launch four funds collectively worth 8.5 million pounds to, to advance diversity. Now let me take you through them. These funds are Elevate, a 2.1 million fund to develop diverse-led organisations that may be future contenders for national portfolio membership. It's critical we nurture new small organisations who will come through to be the great organisations of the future. Unlimited, 1.8 million to continue the support, development and commissioning of a range of new work by deaf and disabled artists. Sustained theatre, that's £2 million repurposed to support established and emerging BME theatre makers across the wider theatre sector in England. And the fourth is change makers, £2.6 million to help address the lack of diversity in arts leadership. A really important issue, and one I hope that the panel will hear some views from the panel on later. We'll be releasing the details and dates for each fund today, and you can get more information from, the, from, from our colleagues here present, and also on our website. Now these funds are in addition 
to the investment that we're making elsewhere through strategic touring, creative people and places, reimagine India, ambition for excellence, and the cultural leadership program. These will reinvigorate our work with cultural education, and they'll help us to capitalize on the wider national distribution of our lottery money. So I'd like to end with a general reflection on the importance of what we're engaged with here. The arts can show us how things are, and the arts, as we know, can give us a vision of what they could be. They can make the case for diversity, but they can also be the case for diversity. They can bring us together. Earlier this year, I spoke at a festival of publishing, and I asked the audience to read some of the poets the Arts Council has helped promote and publish. One of these was the wonderful Wasson Shire. She was born in Kenya to Somali parents and brought up in London. She's an extraordinary young talent who represents a new generation of diverse English writers and voices. I'm very proud that her career has been supported by public funding. And I want now to read a short poem of hers that's recently been shared many thousands of times on social media, particularly since the Paris shootings. You may know it. What they did yesterday afternoon, Walson Shire. They set my aunt's house on fire. I cried the way women on TV do, folding at the middle like a five pound note. I called the boy who used to love me, tried to okay my voice. I said, hello, he said, Wasson, what's wrong? What's happened? I've been praying, and these are what my prayers look like. Dear God, I come from two countries. One is thirsty, the other is on fire. Both need water. Later that night, I held an atlas in my lap, ran my fingers across the whole world, and whispered, where does it hurt? It answered, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Great art that draws on every talent, I think we'll all agree, can speak for all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>